they're not going to go anywhere. The, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry has been around for, for six to 700 years in terms of a very base level of restaurants. And it's been through all sorts of plagues, flus, um, cr serious crises that have, have nearly decimated it, but they've never succeeded because people will always want to go out and eat and drink with their friends, family and celebrate with through food. Hello and welcome to Comms Life from APCO Worldwide. I'm your host, Tom Billinghurst. Every episode, we take a deep dive into the topics and trends shaping the communications industry and beyond. In this episode, we are looking at how the fine dining industry has fared during the COVID-19 pandemic. Casual and fine dining have been the most disproportionately affected sectors in the global F&B industry, with sales in the US alone down by up to 85% in 2020. With many of the world's most esteemed restaurants unable to offer customers the experiences they paid top dollar for, many have had to pivot, find alternative ways of generating revenues, or shut down either temporarily or indefinitely. So how do they come back? And what are the most pressing challenges facing communicators in the F&B and hospitality space? Joining us to discuss this topic is Mark Sansom, content editor of the world's 50 best restaurants, 50 best bars, and 50 best discovery. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Tom. Thank you very much for having me on. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. So Mark, before we get stuck into this uh, quite hefty topic, as your title suggests, your job is probably one of the most enviable in the world of journalism today. So dispel some myths for us or, or relish in it as you see fit. What exactly does the content editor of the world's 50 best restaurants and bars do on a daily basis? Uh, I think if we, in, in peacetime, if we can, if we can call it that, or, nor, or normal times, I, I certainly can't complain. Um, I've lived in, I've, I've worked in, worked in hospitality media uh, lifestyle magazines for about 15 years now and it really this is the kind of the the culmination the job that I've always dreamed of getting and yeah I wouldn't I would really wouldn't change it for the world at all but in terms of in terms of a day-to-day -day, we um uh, my team and I we put out sort of 20 odd stories a week on the uh, global hospitality sector and and rough fine dining restaurants and bars and, and also restaurants in the casual sector um, but recently, we sort of pivoted our, our role to supporting those restaurants and bars, um, which I think we'll probably come on to discuss a bit later. But, but yeah, it's a really good job. Um, we're, currently, we're just currently looking at how we can help the hospitality industry get through this tricky period and get back into some positive times, really. Yeah. Mark, I think you're probably being a bit humble in uh, describing the mechanics of uploading stories and writing stories because a short scroll through any of your social media feeds uh, we'll, we'll show some of the most sumptuous and delectable food and drink there is in the world. So let's put it in layman's terms. You eat the best food, you drink the best drinks, and then you write about it, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty pretty concise way of, of putting it, Tom. Yeah, spot on. Uh, I mean, we're a, 50 Best is a live events business. Usually we'll put on in the region of 10 to 15 sort of huge scale events all over the world every year. And uh, we're obviously not able to do that at the moment. And with with that comes the hardship of having to try a few decent restaurants and bars uh, along the way. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty, pretty good. Um, I certainly can't complain. So I imagine uh, that the, obviously the, the traveling, the new restaurant openings and the wine tastings have, have slowed down somewhat. So so what does that look like on a, on a, on a daily basis for you now? Yeah, I think at the, at the beginning of at the beginning of 2020, um, all credit to 50 Best MD, uh, Tim Brook Webb, he, well, we realized what was coming down the down the road in terms of the pandemic and that we weren't going to be able to operate as we were and we would do in normal times by running these uh, 10 to 15 events a year. So we, we made the decision that we were going to spend the year focusing on helping out the hospitality sector. And we, we launched an initiative called 50 Best for Recovery, whereby through a number of initiatives, the, the main one being our bid for recovery auction which took place last June we've raised to date around 1.5 million dollars which we've been able to distribute to restaurants and bars all over the world not just those fine dining establishments on our lists uh, we've been giving them grants of sort of five thousand um, dollars to try and get them through the try and get them through the trickiest of periods we realize that that's not gonna not gonna change the world but it might keep the keep the wolf from the door for from the immediate future absolutely I guess you probably had more time to perhaps emulate and cook some of the recipes that you would otherwise have had uh, cooked for you at your leisure when you were visiting the restaurant. So I guess there's a silver lining there. But Mark, with your role as a content editor for, for 50 Best, 
uh, you will see a, a swathe of press releases, lots of media outreach, lots of activations and initiatives coming your way from people in the comms and PR F and B sector. Um, because let's face it, everyone would love to be featured in, in 50 best, but I wonder putting 2020 into perspective, um, what has stood out to you as examples of best practice? Like who's got your attention? How have restaurants handled this situation the best in terms of, mm. you know, both what they've been able to offer customers who haven't been able to come through the doors and how they've communicated the changes in their value proposition along the way? For sure. Yeah, I think most hospitality communications uh, in normal times and indeed uh, in the past sort of 12 months, they tend to be quite localized, often country by country, more likely to be city by city. So uh, a communications agency will generally specialize on one city, so Dubai or London, and then have a really good network of journalists who, they, who they're on, in touch with on a regular basis. Um, few hospitality comms companies operate on a global level, which, which I've always found quite surprising. Um, for example, they're on most of the restaurants on the world's 50 best bars and restaurants list will generally have around 70% of their custom and custom coming from international gastro travelers, um, which, which is, which is, makes it quite surprising that they don't focus on the, the local crowd so much in terms of, in terms of the press release, but throughout the pandemic, we've seen a real sort of doubling down of the, of the localized effort, but the most successful comms have come from companies where that are keeping, keeping the industry abreast of what's going on, even if, uh, even if it's just a business update to say, look, we're opening, we're opening for this period here, our opening, our opening hours have changed there. It helps us as a business build up a global picture. So the, the companies which, uh, which are coming to us with even what might seem the pretty insignificant news, that, that's been where we've found real interest in sort of building up this global picture. In terms of, in terms of success, I think you've got to look at um, Noma in Copenhagen, which, uh, which first incarnation of the, of the restaurant was the world's best restaurant in, in 2014. Um, and immediately, uh, Rene Rezepi, he pivoted to turn his fine dining restaurant into a burger bar, uh, which opened back in, back in May. And it gave the opportunity for, for local uh, people who live in Copenhagen to come to the restaurant. Now, they were, in the first few days or even the first week of opening, there were queues around the block, people queuing, local people queuing for around six, seven hours just to get a taste of the burger. So yeah, I think the, the restaurants which have really doubled down and focused on their, their local crowd have, have been showing great success. Success, and it's and it's really sort of reassuring to see that even though even though the restaurants are closed and, and no doubt and then make no bones about it it's been a it's been a very very tough year for hospitality but restaurants have been able to survive by being very very creative uh, focusing on that local environment and and getting themselves ready for when hopefully that gastro travel can start up again perhaps on a on a kind of final note on 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 this topic we've seen mark in the US as, as one example um, of, a, of a globalized market, the kind of you know, tremendously deep impact that COVID has had on fine and, and casual dining, um, which are those sectors that are predicated on experience. You go to the restaurant, not just to eat the food, but to take part in the experience, which um, is part of your uh, remit, terrible as it is. <laughs> um, you know, and we've seen things like uh, pizza restaurants and, and food delivery apps. They have absolutely skyrocketed those at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, they've really thrived. And obviously different cities have different rules. So the percentages of the reduced sales are going to vary uh, across the world. But the trend is the same. Restaurants have, have really suffered and, and lost big on, on their revenues. But I wonder what kind of lasting effect you think the trends from 2020 and now moving into 2021 what they will have on the landscape of fine and casual dining. What do you think we can expect to see more of? What can we see less of as we as we move ahead towards some kind of recovery? Yeah, I think you've 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 hit the nail on the head there. It's the the ready to drink cocktails in the bar sector, which are delivered to delivered to people's houses, uh, and the the meal kits and and sort of restaurant takeaways is one revenue stream that that's just not going to go away. This revenue stream has been really, really successful for a number of businesses. Um, to think of a couple of examples, um, Tim Rao, um, chef owner of restaurant Tim Rao in Berlin, Germany, has been a real, real success story here. He's uh, he's got five, uh, four restaurants in, in in Berlin. So he didn't he didn't pivot in, immediately. He gave it three weeks. He took a he stepped back after the um, the German government shut down hospitality in in Berlin and wider afield, and looked at the the menu concepts across his four his four um, four restaurants and decided what would be the most coherent, the most successful 
uh, one menu that could speak to all of those restaurants and serve the German community. He came up with a delivery concept he called um, "fucking great, which um, speaks to his sort of irreverent nature and the way he, he goes about his business. And within three weeks uh, of launching the, uh, the concept, he, he was up to 70% revenue from pre-COVID time. So that was that's really good to see that being able to step back and take a take an actual look at the the sector and what they could and what the business could do. So you could argue there are some there are some success stories out there, but it's um it, it, it's been that's not to sugarcoat the fact that it's been very very tough for the industry. But people who have pivoted and also in the in my hometown of London, um, Adam Handling of um, the Frog Group of restaurants and Adam Handling in Covent Garden made a really really successful um, cook at home concept. Now this it's not the takeaways of old, and I'm sure your your listeners and viewers. Have have they've even tried these these dine at home concepts that you also learn a bit as you're doing it so that the, the meals will arrive nearly ready to cook and they'll require a, a final bit of assembly but but Adam Adam in London he, he's done the same for Christmas and he's he's managed to manage to sell over a thousand units of uh, Christmas dinner at around 250 pounds a pop uh, 250 pounds a pop which um, which comes which is all cooked from his staff so he's given that he's able to give all of his staff work while uh, while the restaurants are forced into closure and I mean you only need to do the maths thousand units of 250 250 pounds is is a good business by anyone's money thanks for tuning into comms life by apco worldwide if you're enjoying this subscribe to our youtube channel and follow us wherever you get your podcasts from catch up on all our previous episodes where we discuss everything from the future of aviation with arabian aerospace to the global economic recovery with The Economist. Welcome back to Comms Life from APCO Worldwide. We are here with Mark Sansom, the content editor of the 50 Best Bars and Restaurants. Mark, for the second segment, we're taking a look at a recent and relevant article um, to the the topic that we've been discussing. We've got one here uh, that was published on Forbes in uh, 2020 with world-renowned chef Daniel Belud sharing his recipe for success amid COVID-19. Um, there's a part um, in the article that, that stands out to me and the, the section from the article reads thus. Um, in May 20, 2020, Belud started a curbside concept, Daniel Belud Kitchen. Yes, many restaurants shifted to curbside service but how many were fine dining restaurants known as much for their five-star service as their Michelin star award-winning food? Imagine taking the highest level of fine dining and turning it into curbside service, yet you do what you must to survive. Chauffeur-driven customers would roll up to the restaurant to enjoy Chef Belude's world-famous culinary skills. And some of the customers would actually enjoy their meals from their cars instead of going home. Now, Mark, I don't know if the chauffeur driven part is hyperbole, but the thing that strikes me here is the fact that people wanted, demanded and found a way to continue eating a a renowned chef's food, regardless of the circumstances. Now, that has to be some kind of remarkable statement about the clientele and the consumer in this space, especially at a time when so many people are thinking about bottom lines and bills and survival. Or would you say that this is symptomatic of that fine dining crowd of which you are ensconced? If if they want their sea scallops and black tie, they're going to find a way of getting it. That's a wonderful image, isn't it? I got a guy, a guy or a girl sitting in a backseat of a limousine eating uh, eating sea scallops. That's uh, it's really nice. And to be honest, I I don't think that's probably too far from the truth. restaurants i mean you you cite daniel boulard there's many many others uh in in new york and further afield in in the states and of course across europe and indeed the middle east people at the top end i think have been least affected by by coronavirus particularly the, their but their own bottom line that may be quite a wide-ranging generalization but i think as with as with uh, lots of these things people people who who are fortunate enough to be able to eat in fine dining restaurants three or four times a week, they're not going to stop doing that. They're not going to, they're not going to take second best in terms of their food. So 
chefs such as Daniel and, and wider afield, they, they want to be able to sate these customers' desires. Now, that's always going to happen. But what the curbside fine dining and, and again, the image of a limousine pulling up to pick up sea scallops, I think that's probably a little, little hyperbolic, as you alluded to, but it's made fine dining a little bit more democratic. I mean, we spoke, we spoke a little bit earlier about how people might have been might have been a little bit put off by the by the trappings of fine dining. If you want to eat your if you want to eat your sea scallops in your car, it gives you the access to that food. And sure, it, you lose a lot of the ambience of the restaurant, the wine service, the everything that goes goes towards putting together a great restaurant experience that everyone loves. It's great. It's great that it's been given given the opportunity to go to a, a different kind of person who might not want to do that. There's there's a, a part of this this article focusing on uh, Chef Belud's pivot that mentions how he jumped in to support food first to create up to 2000 meals a day while offering jobs to laid off workers, including his own team. And the initiative gave him uh, much needed exposure in the community for both the charity and his brand. Um, something as a, as a communicator, I find something really interesting there. We've been very careful uh, when um, advising and consulting with clients never to appear opportunistic at this moment because of the nature of, of how that can make you come across. Yet there's there's a, a, a business piece in, in Forbes here that's, that says, you know, this initiative gave him and his brand the exposure that it needed to at, at, the, at the time when it needed to most. So I wonder what your thoughts are there in terms of, you know, that perception of a brand um, making the most of this um, opportunity to, to come front and center in people's minds. Um, but also to comment on the, the giving back mentality, uh, something that the fine dining industry has been able to do more than others because of the, the level of prestige and the platform that it has to be able to do so. Lots of chefs and bartenders weren't the kind of people who, who were inspired in traditional ac academic fields. They were looking for other outlets for their sort of creative brilliance. So there's, there's always been a huge amount of empathy in the, in the hospitality sector. Every chef or bartender will have had to work from the ground up. So they will have appreciated what it takes to work on low wages and get their way to the top. So the chefs will always be empathetic towards people um, worse off than themselves. And I think that's really, really come through. I mean, you, you cited um, Boulard there also in, in, uh, in New York, um, a, a bar slash restaurant called Dante, fronted by a guy, uh, an Australian couple, uh, Lyndon Pride and Natalie Hudson, they they did a very very similar thing and started pivoting their their own kitchens to be able to cook for for the community and local local services and hospitals. So while you, you you're quite right in saying it's not it's not a they won't be um, they won't be unaware of the positive PR that, that these things can come. I do I think it's a little bit over cynical to think that they would be the that would be the key driver as to why they're doing these things and I think that because chefs and bartenders are so connected from the ground up uh, in these industries they see it as their social responsibility to help out where, where they can and also while they're producing 5,000 2,000 meals a day for they're also being able to give jobs to their workers who would otherwise be laid off that they, they would fully realize that there's some positive press to be had out of it but I, I do fully believe it comes from it comes from a very good place and wanting to help out and therein that connection to the ground up therein lies the kind of authenticity and sincerity that we've been saying for a long for a long time has been what plays out the best in in these situations when you when you can empathize and, and really get that empathy across it's a really interesting point um mark we, we both read the article was was there something was there anything that jumped out to you in this piece the main thing that I sort of took away from this is, is the notion of what luxury actually means and what luxury is going to mean going forward. Now, um, with the world's 50 best, I put together an article at the beginning of uh, beginning of 2020 that, that asked the question, what, what is luxury in this new decade? Are we entering a decade of anti-decadence? Whereas previously we were looking at um, restaurant menus, which would be a roll call of finery, everything from international caviar, longer steam. Now, People are taking, a, people are chefs are taking a step back and looking at ingredients in an entirely different way. And now it's not so sexy to to fly in, fly in these ingredients just for the for the diner's experience. What what people are really reveling in and seeing what is luxurious is is how the the product can speak to its region and how the the story of the product is as important as the product itself. Now, inevitably, things generally taste better when you eat them near where they're grown. So if you look at a couple of examples, um, Claire Smith, who's got a restaurant called Core in London. Uh, she she devotes a lot of lot of time and effort into a lamb fat carrot. Now all that all that dish is is a locally grown carrot swaddled in lamb fat, which is absolutely delicious, but not 
something that you might previously associate with luxury and fine dining. So I think people and diners particularly are asking themselves what luxury is going to mean uh, in the in the sort of the next 10 years coming forward. And I think people are going to start valuing time as a luxury. Um, and people, while they will be still traveling to international restaurants as soon as they're able to, it's the notion of, of how luxury can be conveyed without seeming ostentatious that I think the, art, the writer touches on quite nicely in that article. And, and it's certainly lots of questions and hopefully lots of exciting questions about how, how restaurants and bars are going to reset and reopen in the, in the years to come. Because look, they're not going to go anywhere. The, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry has been around for, for six to 700 years in terms of a very base level of restaurants. And it's been through all sorts of plagues, flus, um, cr serious crises that have, have nearly decimated it, but they've never succeeded because people will always want to go out and eat and drink with their friends, family, and celebrate with through food. We hope you're enjoying this APCO Worldwide production. To find out more of what we do in the communication space, head to apcoworldwide.com and see how we are helping firms build back stronger. Welcome back to Comms Life from Apco Worldwide. We're still here with Mark Sansom, content editor of the world's 50 best. Mark, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we got your thoughts on where the F&B industry, particularly fine and casual dining industry is headed post COVID in 2021. Um, but now for the final segment, we've got some getting to know you questions, which for some reason became a fan favorite from season one. So I'm going to throw these your way and see what you've got for us. Shoot. Looking forward to it. Your earliest childhood memory. Oh, um, I think that would have to be ah, learning to swim on holiday with my with my mum and dad. The, the worst thing you've ever eaten. Oh, Oh, that's controversial, Tom. Um, I'm sure you'd appreciate that the restaurants uh, will have to remain nameless uh, in the interest. Of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, one dish really does spring to mind. It was a new restaurant in, in London, actually, where, the, where, it, where it started the meal with uh, an oyster sorbet. Now, I love oysters. Oysters are one of my favourite things in the world, but they have no place being turned into into any sort of iced or ice cream. And it put the and it set the stall out for what proved to be a rather a rather disappointing meal and I, I can still taste the I can still taste the uh, ugh, excessive salinity and, and slightly sort of fishy taste of those at the, at the back of my palate. <laughs> <laughs> Serves you right for eating yeah. such fancy food. Right. Um, then the one restaurant you cannot wait to go back to when all of the uh, pandemic nonsense is behind us. Oh God, um, I don't think I could name one in particular, more maybe a trope of restaurants. I, I can't wait to go for, uh, for a, to a, a British curry house. Beautiful stuff. Hasn't made me miss home at all. <laughs> now here's one for you. One work of art that you would suggest everyone experiences in their lifetime, be it novel, poem, piece of art, music. What is it? That's tough. Uh, I think it would probably, it would probably have to be the book that got me into into literature. Um, it was Irvin Welsh's breakthrough novel, Train Spotting, uh, and it really sort of moved me. And it spoke to, and it spoke to a period in time which which where I was quite sort of in my formative years, looking for looking for for artistic artistic things to hang my hat on. And yeah, that was it was a great book, and I, I'm sure everyone can can read it and get something from it. Okay, your perfect escape. Oh. Funnily enough, I was discussing this with my with my fiance just just yesterday. We, I'm I'm very fortunate. She uh, she's a, a magazine editor and specialises in hotels, so I've been quite lucky to to be her plus one on going to going to lots and lots of nice nice hotels all over the world. So I think it would have to be uh, a luxury resort with an excellent golf course where I can where I can go along and uh, play in the morning and spend the afternoon having a have a nice lunch and then propping up a, a beach bar for the rest of the afternoon. Sounds terrible. <laughs> Lastly, if you could live the life of anybody else, who would it be? Oh, tough. I think it would have to be a professional golfer of the, uh, of the last sort of 10 years. I, I think Rory McIlroy has made, made some good decisions uh, recently. Um, so I think, yeah, I'd, I wouldn't. And I think they probably, they probably travel pretty well. They, they probably eat in some jolly nice restaurants. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I'll take, I'll take, uh, take Rory McIlroy. Brilliant stuff. Mark, thanks ever so much for joining us on Comms Life. Absolute pleasure to have you. No, thanks for having me, Tom. Real pleasure. 
Thanks for listening to Comms Life. If you like that, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Send us any questions or comments on our Twitter page. And while you're at it, you can subscribe to and download Comms Life on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts from. Stay safe and be well.